Hello, welcome to the Wisdom in Times of Crisis online event, where we explore the wisdom of these challenging times. My name is Jean-Ric Meller, and I have the great pleasure to be in a conversation with Chris Fields and Davor Jalto. Chris Fields, how to describe you? Um, you are an, an independent researcher with a background in physics, information theory, biology, neuroscience, and uh, you study the uh, nature of consciousness, that is, um, how one part of the universe, us, can be aware of the other parts. Is it fair to say? Yes, your, that's quite fair. <laughs> your, your bio also says that you've been a volunteer firefighter, a visual artist, a travel writer, and that now you live half of the time in the small French village of Con Minervois near Carcassonne. Um, that's quite a diverse background. <laughs> and Davor, you uh, you're you're a professor in, in professor in religion, art, and democracy. That's quite a combination. Yeah, quite a quite a combination, but. <laughs> I enjoy all these different hats that uh, I also wear from time to time, just like uh, pretty much similar to Chris, except that my focuses are not that much uh, physics and consciousness per se, but rather the issues such as human creativity, uh, freedom, and these kind of things. Well, I look forward to hear what this part has to say about the uh, current crisis. But just for openings, we have... Um, the there are two words in in English that uh, come from the same Latin root actually, the, and and that that word is in Eng, in Latin is species and it means appearance. And those two words are special and species, and uh, it is true that um, as a cultural assumption. It is a very strong one for human beings that as a species, we are special. There is a sort of uh, uh, anthropomorphic uh, exceptionalism where we, we think we are humans, an evolutionary culmination rather than the youngest species to join the list of living things. Um, but what if we drop that assumption? What if uh, we looked at this as only an appearance, a species? And what we, if we were to look at humanity as just another organism? So I'll, I'll, I'll let you take, take uh, whoever wants to take, uh, to take on that first. Uh, well, let me uh, say something here. Um, this, this specialness assumption has been with us a long time, uh, probably from the invention of language at any rate. But uh, certainly dominates our cultural thinking uh, with the invention of agriculture and cities, which is a huge transition in human evolution. And with that uh, effectively increase in power over the environment, uh, enabled by agriculture and cities, we further distanced ourselves from the idea of ourselves as organisms. And, and nature keeps tapping us on the shoulder now and then and reminding us that we're organisms and that we're a part of a much larger living structure, which is all of life or the biome or whatever you want to call it, Gaia. And that if we, to the extent that we forget that, we get into trouble. And we, we interpret things in ways that don't make any sense. So we currently have this idea of coronavirus as a disease that is attacking us and from our point of view, that's, a, that's an accurate characterization. But it's also, I think, very useful to think about the current situation from 
the point of view of the virus, right? The virus is uh, not a, a living creature, but it's nonetheless a, a replicating evolutionary phenomenon. And it's subject to natural selection in the same way that we are, except natural selection works very rapidly. And from its point of view, we're habitat. We're just a place to live. And it's lived in many different places before. And in fact, I recently read a nice paper from Betty Corbin's group in Los Alamos about where the various parts of this virus came from. Uh, and you know, there are hundreds, thousands, maybe many more of viruses very similar to this floating around in wild populations. And some of them will probably eventually make their way into the human part of their habitat, their potential habitat. And once they start inhabiting us, uh, natural selection will increase the population of viral variants that inhabit us successfully. And what does that mean? Well, it means uh, viruses that inhabit lots of us and uh, viruses that move easily from person to person. But if you're a virus and you kill your host, you destroy your habitat, then your evolutionary line ends. So natural selection tends to drive these systems in the direction of uh, successfully inhabiting their host forever. And if you look at the human genome, it's probably about slightly more than a third viruses that have been inhabiting our lineage since the early divergence of the mammals. So long, long before primates came into existence. So these are some of the most successful viruses in the universe uh, because they inhabit every mammal and have very little effect uh, and are now essential parts of our genomes. So we have to keep them alive. <laughs> we, are, we are, in a sense, their domestic animals. Um, so I think it's useful to um, kind of turn the tables on this notion of human specialness and, and think about the hu humans ourselves as individuals and as populations from the point of view of other parts of life. And uh, what you see is something that's interestingly different from what you see when you think only from the perspective of an individual human or, or the special species of human beings. Yeah, so from the point of view of the virus, we are a habitat, and that habitat is um, just, just we can think of it as just the way uh, the universe, the, the, the earth is for us. It has its uh, challenges and it has its dangers, and for the virus, we, we are not a, we are, we are a habitat, but a dangerous one, right? Yes, we're very dangerous. We have an immune system uh, that doesn't like viruses. <laughs> uh, we have a very active microbiome uh, that doesn't particularly like viruses. So we're a very, we're a very challenging habitat to live in. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are determined to <laughs> get rid of <laughs> but from a from the point of view of um, you know, you say that the it's the evolutionary uh, advantage for the to of the for the virus to keep us alive. Yes, that is correct. But the virus doesn't quote know that since it's the first time it's invading, it might it it is going to do what it's going to do, and well, yeah. we are. We are relatively lucky that this one is relatively innocuous, correct? Right, that yes. It, it, if, if it had been a virus like Ebola, uh, mutating to, tra to transmit uh, on, uh, through the air, we would have had a much, much, much worse epidemic. 
we would be in much worse shape and yes, yes. and be looking at a much worse future. Yes. <laughs> Very good. Um, Davo, do you have anything you want to say? Yeah, I, I uh, like the way uh, Chris uh, uh, put uh, the whole draw, uh, drew the whole picture. Uh, but I would uh, slightly, dis it's not even a, a disagreement, but rather pointing to one dimension of our being special in this world. Uh, and that is that we are uh, in a pretty unique position among all other species that we can destroy uh, the whole entire life on this planet. So as far as we know so far, uh, no other virus or animal or anybody else uh, is in a position to do that. So that, among other things, uh, makes us uh, very special. And, uh, and we are also in the position to actually uh, make that decision. Uh, do we want to sustain life on this planet and sustain human life on this planet uh, together with animal and you know, all sorts of other uh, life forms? Or are we going to destroy uh, the very possibility of organized human life and uh, most of animal and other life uh, in the world. So there is something uh, that uh, each, I would say, uh, species is special in many different ways, has certain capacities that others do not have, so we cannot just fly like birds, and birds cannot do many things that we can. But I think this is a pretty... Uh, unique as far as we know and Chris please uh, correct me if uh, if you can think of anything else in this uh, uh, history of uh, the whole evolution uh, up to up to this moment where one form of life uh, became so overpowerful so dominant that it threatens uh, the existence of the planet or the entire life on the planet Oh, well, it's certainly true that, that um, no other species has invented nuclear warfare, uh, thankfully. Uh, other species have, have certainly invented climate change before. And uh, it first happened with the cyanobacteria that are responsible for Earth having an atmosphere that contains a significant amount of oxygen. And uh, when that change occurred, uh, a, a lot of organisms that were, were anaerobic, <laughs> who didn't like oxygen, had to live underwater or live deep underground or live somewhere other than uh, in association with the atmosphere. So it was certainly a big deal. So uh, biological climate change is nothing new. Uh, what we're capable of is extremely rapid climate change. And uh, because we've, we've invented a culture that's extremely fragile, <laughs> uh, that very rapid climate change uh, will probably damage us most significantly first. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah, we are, I mean, technologically, we, we are absolutely unique. But Earth, is, Earth has been through many mass extinctions before. And... You uh, hope it will survive us as well. I, I am absolutely confident that, that Earth will have no problem surviving us. I mean, there, there are organisms living in environments that we can't get close to. And they're, they're very interesting and very creative and, and very determined to keep on going. Mm. And what is, what, what is your take? Uh, what do you think our, our chances are, Grace? Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, I think our chances are not good unless we wise up. Huh. <laughs> Certainly, if you think in the time frame of a couple of centuries. Right, right, which is nothing in evolutionary terms. Right, yet which is... Yet is everything in history, in human history at this point. 
Yeah, yeah we're uh, certainly living interesting times. We live in very interesting times. I mean, we are uh, on this uh, spiral of very rapid technological development. And mm -hmm. uh, where that's going, I think, is, is very difficult to predict. But, uh, I mean, it's certain that we cannot count on biological evolution uh, based on, on differential reproduction to uh, make any of the changes that need to be made in the way we deal with the world. Yeah, it doesn't seem adequate anymore. No. The, time, the, the, the time scales are just, right. are just not right. We, we don't have a few hundred thousand years to figure this out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wow. Well, we've been through we've been through through plagues before, as you were saying. And uh, you know, if you think of the the the, the Black Plague um, that has been with us for many many years, uh, centuries uh, probably altogether, and uh, it was a time where uh, religion actually was 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 reborn was was reinforced because that the only thing that gave a, uh, that that gave a, a meaning to what was happening they didn't have science then um, do you see Davo, do you see anything that that the uh, religion and the pandemic have to do with each other today well religion can be pandemic you know uh, that is uh, that is uh, one thing. So all sorts of uh, different um, systems of ideas or ideologies, and religion is one of them, uh, can be uh, extremely dangerous and can also be very beneficial. Uh, depends on on the kind of uh, system of ideas we're talking about, and and of course how people uh, understand those ideas and how they implement them. Uh, it's very difficult to talk about religion, uh, generally speaking, because it's very unclear what do we mean by that. Uh, and and uh, if you ask a uh, hundred people, uh, you you will get a hundred different uh, responses, and at that point it becomes a very useless uh, concept. But uh, um, I would say that uh, uh, it is uh, it is one way of making sense of the world, and in essence. Uh, in pre-modern times, very often what we nowadays call science and what we nowadays would call um, some ideologies within the socio-political sphere, uh, all of that belonged actually also to the uh, sphere of religion. Uh, and, and also medicine and many medical treatments and many scientific inventions uh, also in different parts of the world uh, actually uh, happened took place within something that you could generally call religious or religious philosophical uh, system. So it's uh, it's a very uh, complicated story, but I think uh, uh, an important uh, part of that story is uh, the the values and intentions behind certain ideas and certain practices. So just as certain forms or certain forms of understanding of religious ideas can be extremely uh, dangerous and can actually produce a lot of violence and wars and uh, fanaticism, uh, so can certain nowadays, uh, let's say, economic theories. I mean, if you think about religious fundamentalism and free market fundamentalism, it's very difficult to say what's different, uh, different except that nowadays free market fundamentalism produces much more harm than religious fundamentalism. So it's, it's uh, the, these concepts, I, I'm always very careful when we use them because, and of course, they also mean different things in different parts of the world. So based on people's experiences, and one thing is to talk about religion in the Middle Ages, another thing in the Roman times, and another thing in the Soviet Union, and, and nowadays, let's say, North America. So all these uh, different meanings of, of particular concepts have their local, what I like to call flavors, uh, something that is like those things that are not necessarily uh, rationally uh, uh, present in uh, our understanding of the concept, but have all sorts of these uh, emotional and aesthetic elements 
the way what they intimately mean to us depending on our experiences and how, for example, uh, certain concepts are advertised on TV or somewhere else. Yeah, I like the I, I like that uh, what you said about free market fundamentalism. It's it's really the the plague of our times. If you if you look a little deeper, that uh, we've we've kind of locked ourselves in a system where, in order to survive, each individual has to compete and has to produce more, and has to tax the uh, the, the resources of this planet even more, um, you know, the, the work that it used to take a hundred people to do, today we have only, we need only one. And then the, you have 99 other people that are busy justifying, you know, doing some work to justify getting paid, basically. Absolutely. And, and there is the, uh, also this uh, uh, other element to that as one contemporary philosopher, uh, Slavoj Žižek said, uh, we live in such a interesting times in terms of the amount of ideological indoctrination that just belongs to the culture, to the air we breathe, that we can imagine easily the end of the world. We can imagine all sorts of disasters and the world coming to an end, but what nobody can imagine are slight modifications within the capitalist system. That's impossible to do. So raising a little bit of taxes or redistribution, that's uh, beyond imagination. But uh, yeah, the end of the world is, is something that we can easily uh, imagine. So that, that, that shows uh, what's the dominant, if we want to use that uh, term, religion of, of, of our time. So those things that we don't think about and we simply do them, uh, that's what comes pretty much to the literal definition of, of ideology. Yeah, the most, uh, the most optimistic uh, among us are, are uh, hoping that this, this crisis that we're living will, will bring some kind of uh, waking up. And um, I don't know. I have my, I, I have my doubts. What, what do you both think about that? <laughs> um, I could certainly see this uh, crisis if it unfolds slowly enough. Uh, giving people a certain amount of space to reflect and and perhaps come to a different understanding of things. Um, what what I think argues against that possibility is what uh, Davor was just describing in terms of ideology. Uh, our communication systems are so good right now that it may be impossible to actually separate people from their ideology. And uh, profound changes in attitude require a separation from ideology. And that kind of separation can happen not involuntarily, it can be imposed. In many cases, it happens voluntarily. Uh, in some cases, it, it happens, it seems, as just kind of a gift, <laughs> a happy accident, uh, as opposed to something that's actually sought out. But uh, my, my concern is, is uh, and this is, I think a very practical concern for a community like Sand is uh, how can one go about, uh, in a sense, separating people from their ideology in order to provide the space in which uh, reflection on what's going on can happen 
and a change of attitude becomes possible. Well, you made you made a you you described the relationship between people being uh, attached to their ideology in a very strong way and communication system. I mean, I didn't quite follow that that one. Can you say again? You said that. It would, the communication system were so good that it was becoming difficult to separate people from their ideology. Well, think about the internet, right? The internet uh, divides up into ideological ecosystems that, I mean, people often describe the internet as a, a collection of echo chambers. Uh, and that means that whatever your ideology is, it's very easy to find reinforcement. And it's very easy to uh, find reinforcement exclusively. It's very mm -hmm. easy to wall off criticism in a way Whereas that in, yeah. prior Whereas to- in the past you were exposed to right. different viewpoint, whether you want it or not. Today you can, you can choose to surround yourself only with people who think the same way. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, if I may just, uh, just, I think this is very important what Chris uh, uh, just explained. Uh, so on the one hand, there is this, uh, and it's very clear, social networks and uh, all uh, different ways of personalized uh, interfaces, so, so on and so forth. Uh, we witness to, to this uh, simple fact that most people are actually operating within pretty homogeneous uh, uh, ideological spaces where they are confronted mostly with the kind of stuff that they uh, are uh, likely to, to like, to enjoy. Uh, but the problem is that behind all these different pockets and worlds that rarely interact uh, among themselves is the same corporate logic that actually structures uh, instant biases with new technology, of course, which structures that interface. So uh, the reason why certain things are not uh, there for you to see based on your previous history of interacting with various ads and so on and so forth is because somebody can profit based on that. Uh, somebody can exploit uh, what used to be the public sphere, but nowadays is getting more and more privatized. So I think it is a very, uh, uh, a very new situation and uh, when some people were proposing, for example, we can also uh, see another dimension just to add uh, to, to what Chris was uh, explaining. Uh, when we think of this global crisis, uh, you have uh, those voices who are saying things that sound obvious, uh, but there in this obviousness of certain things is always where you find ideology. So things that seem very simple and very kind of plain common sense are very often those ideologically extremely uh, charged. So one of those plain simple things would be let's have a global coordination uh, so that we can establish certain systems that would be uh, able in case of some future pandemic uh, to efficiently react and provide, uh, you know, save us and provide some kind of safe uh, space against all possible all the crisis. But then you ask a question, but who is likely to be in charge of those global systems? Is it, is it a, a worker from, I don't know, Madagascar or you know, Indonesia or somebody who actually takes care of their uh, environment and their neighbors and so on and so forth? Or is it those much more powerful global corporate structures and political structures uh, who would most probably, based on what they have been doing, coming together not to save uh, the species and the planet, but to add another billion to their pockets. So, uh, and, and that is a, a challenge that is really difficult to confront because I think the scale of problems has reached such complexity that it's very difficult to translate that into something that a lot of people in the world will just uh, understand and adopt as their uh, strategy for changing those sociopolitical uh, structures to be able to uh, confront all those uh, significant issues, inclu including uh, global pandemics and environmental crisis and so on and so forth. Uh, so how do you, how do you translate uh, this complexity 
into an action without going through, through some filter of, of, of ideology. Because ideology is just also can be understood as just a system of ideas. So in a certain sense, it's, it's unavoidable. But how do we move from bad and simplistic ideologies that are part of the problem, not part of solution, uh, to those uh, systems of ideas and ideologies, if you will, that would be explanatory and would bear a potential for a real change and improvement in various domains, uh, that's the real issue that's very rarely uh, discussed and especially it's totally uh, absent from any of the mainstream media. Yeah, that's, that's a very interesting point. And uh, when one thinks about, for example, uh, scientific collaboration, uh, one can see this very clearly. Uh, you know, for example, the people doing molecular epidemiology on this current virus are able to analyze in real time uh, hundreds of new viral sequences per day. And in order to understand what the virus itself is doing, uh, how many substrains are there, how prevalent are there, do they have any differences in lethality or, or transmissivity or anything like that. And that capability is completely dependent on the internet. It's completely dependent on the last 30 years of technology development that has brought the cost of DNA analysis down by many orders of magnitude. Um, so it's completely dependent on exactly the sort of system that you describe. Uh, yet it also uh, provides probably our best hope of understanding what's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, another, I think another interesting example to think about is the open software movement, where again, completely dependent on technology development and the internet, uh, we now have very complex software systems that are built by of uh, thousands of volunteers that are not centrally coordinated uh, in any way, except by a mechanism for, in effect, peer review. And this has changed the, in a sense, the, the economic structure of the software industry enormously. So there, there, there are ways that, that these supporting organizations support organizations on top of them <laughs> uh, that can be very creative. So I, I think that the, the uh, I, I don't really want to say contradiction or conflict, but the, uh, the deep kind of incompatibility between uh, very democratic ways of doing things and very centralized ways of doing things get combined in these systems in ways that lead to surprising sorts of, of phenomena. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And this is the, and, and this is, this is all new. This is all new. We can say the, We've had many plagues, we've had many pandemics, we've had many crises over time, but it has never been in an environment which has this much access to information, this much access to computer power, this much access to, to um, collaboration in a way. So there's, there is something new about this, this, this time, right? I mean, looking at the, at the looking as a molecular biologist at the, the difference in understanding achieved with this pandemic and say the, the AIDS pandemic, uh, it's, it's astonishing how different it is. I mean, things are being understood within weeks in this case that required years in that case. Right. 
Hmm. And that suddenly um, uh, giving us a little hope for <laughs> us for for change. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I I always like to quote Gramsci and his famous line that we should always keep uh, the pe pessimism of the mind and optimism of the will. So I think that is, uh, it's a realistic, looking realistic, you know, we should be critical and, but even if our reason tells us that it's all, you know, going in a wrong direction and it's hopeless, uh, we should still keep uh, this optimism of the will, uh, meaning that very often the, the things are much more complex than we can possibly uh, comprehend. So actually trying to change the course of events can bring about a change that nobody could even dream of. So therefore there is always hope as long as we want to do some kind of change. That's, that's a very, very good remark. I thank you for bringing that up. Yes, we, we are, we are embedded in systems uh, that are much more complex than we understand and are guaranteed to surprise us. Mm -hmm. And I mean, certainly the, the natural world has that characteristic. Mm -hmm. Davo, I think you were bringing some interesting points uh, before on the, where um, you know, the, difference, the difference between for our species, it, it tends to live in, we tend to live in our head. Uh, we tend to live in representations and we tend to impose, superimpose those representations over the world. And that changes, uh, that influences the way we think of being special or not being special. And, uh, and that also is, is linked to the way that we treat other species and that we, the way we treat other living and non-living uh, things in the world. And I'd love to hear a little more about that. Well, it's, uh, I mean, we, we started in, in preparation for, for this conversation, just to kind of uh, give our viewers a little bit of a background. So uh, we put out some, some questions and ideas and, and some uh, kind of ob pretty simple observations. And one of them was uh, that in a certain sense, uh, we uh, live with this uh, paradox that our personal experience is always that there is the world outside out there and there is us and there is uh, this interaction between us and the world yeah it sounds pretty simple uh and it seems to be true but except that nobody can actually prove that uh and and another problem is that all these interactions and chris actually uh, will be in a much better position to talk about that uh uh, those interactions so that what we perceive or what appears to us as objects in the world, other beings in the world and our uh, working different stuff in the world, uh, that, that all of that is actually something that happens not out there, but happens in our head. So based on all uh, series of sensory uh, experiences and uh, what our brain does with them and uh, how it does it based on our previous experiences and so on and so forth. So uh, those representations of our interactions with the world is something that happens in our head. Uh, and in a certain sense, the world is present in our head. Uh, and we cannot even, it's not clear what it would mean not to have uh, such kind of uh, mediated experience of the world because if we try to shut down uh, all these sensory experiences we'll end up uh, not actually uh, having probably any any representations or any ways of of, of uh, doing or behaving in any meaningful way in this in this world so i think these uh, the way in which we make sense of these representations goes back to the story about ideology so how we understand then how we construct certain meanings vis-a-vis -vis those experiences that we have. Uh, and that very often is the place where then we need to make certain choices and we need to take a stand vis-a-vis -vis, uh, things that we do or that appear to us that we do in the way we interact with the world. So one of them is how do we treat other uh, living organisms? 
So one way is to construct a narrative which says that our primary purpose here is to uh, use whatever we can uh, for our benefit, uh, no matter what. And, and we can not only kill uh, any way we want and torture other animals, but also other human beings. And we the idea that, uh, you know, we do all sorts of things, but there is a good intention behind it behind that and that seems to be also i mean we can discuss that as well but it seems this this uh moral sense that it is also part of our biological property because everyone has this um uh, instinctive idea to justify what we do even if we do the most horrific things we do that under the pretense some there is a rationale that is somehow good if you go to the worst uh, uh you know, uh, gangsters, and and you ask them, you know, why do you do that? There is some rationale. They'll probably tell you, you know, there is some higher good purpose for their family, for themselves, and so on and so forth. Uh, so and we we adopt these narratives also when it comes to uh, the rest of uh, our environment and 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 planet, and it is also some, something that that uh, where we are free to uh, make this choice and say, well, whether that will be the rationale and whether our actions in this world or our interactions with all those representations that, uh, that we have in our uh, head vis-a-vis -vis the world will be using them for these kind of purposes based on these kind of rationales or based on something else. So there is nothing really compelling us to see in this world, the way it appears to us, just a place that we want to exploit. We can do that, but there is nothing compelling us to do that. Uh, just as there is nothing compelling us to see other animals and uh, uh, other fellow human beings as a source of profits or, again, exploitation or something that benefits uh, me, as opposed to benefits uh, everybody within a community or the global community. So these choices are something that that's then based on, again, certain narratives and certain values. How do we establish them? How do we cultivate them? That's a whole different story. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Chris, I was, I, was interested, I was interested when you, you were talking about the, uh, the different pieces, where are the, you know, switching subject, where are the different pieces, uh, pieces of the virus? Um, came into our history, and you said there was only the third time or something. I had something I didn't really quite catch on, but maybe you want to explain that a little more in, in depth. Uh, were, were you asking about uh, the the work being done on analyzing where the various bits of coronavirus came from, or yes, or yes, endemic yes, yes. viruses in humans? Both. Uh, well, uh, the, let me start with the second question, because it, it actually illuminates the first. Uh, viruses are basically little packages of genetic information that are protected in one way or another against the environment. And their role in evolution, if you think it, in, about evolution at a large scale, is to move bits of, of genetic material around between different lineages. So if you look in, in the world of microbes, in the world of bacteria and archaea, then these organisms are exchanging DNA amongst themselves over very long kind of genetic distances in lineage. And if you ask what kinds of DNA do they exchange, mostly they exchange DNA that's useful for dealing with some local environmental challenge. So uh, some microbial population may be really good at, at doing something like digesting petroleum, and uh, some other microbial lineage moves into that environment there's a reasonably good chance that they're going to, to acquire some of that DNA that will help them to just petroleum. 
And we see this all the time in the phenomenon of antibiotic resistance. Uh, microbes don't have to each one evolve antibiotic resistance on their own all by themselves uh, because they can get it from their friends. And they get it via transmission of, with little packages of DNA that we call viruses. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so viruses play a very important role in life. They're a communication medium from the point of view of long, large scale, kind of long time range evolution. They're a way of moving information around. And they're very good at it. And so to, to come back to the first part of that question, if you look at uh, some population of viruses that inhabit some population of environments, say some group of species of animals, then they're going to be moving around and, and say uh, you, some cell in your body becomes infected by two different viruses from different sources. And when viruses get into your cells, what they do is replicate. So they're going to be replicating at the same time, and it means that you'll have some hodgepodge of genetic information from the two different viruses getting recombined with each other. And so you'll create all sorts of molecular diversity. And most of that, most of those molecules won't be able to, be, to survive. You know, they won't be able to live within the little protective coatings that they have to live in when they're out in the open environment. But some of them will. And so you get very rapid evolution. And it's not just one strain slowly varying in one environment. I mean, of course, you see that. But you also see this very broad kind of recombinatorial mixing, especially over longer time, time frames. So the... If you think about coronaviruses as a family that inhabit uh, large numbers of different species of various kinds of animals, then uh, you expect them to get together now and then and, and produce hybrids uh, that mix together DNA from viruses in different lineages and then that new construct <laughs> uh, lives however it lives. So uh, again, it's an, it's an unpredictable complex system. Thank you. Thank you, that's fascinating. And uh, I would love to ask more questions about this, but I get a message from Ronald saying <laughs> that uh, we're running out of time. And so uh, do you have any, any last remark you want to share with us, either of you? Some uh, pearl of wisdom for those times? <laughs> Chris? <laughs> <laughs> I was going, I've just been speaking, so I would turn to you. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I, I would just, uh, well, uh, you know, uh, to repeat what, uh, what I mentioned before about, you know, Gramsci's advice and, and, uh, uh, I think uh, what we know about human beings so far, it's not a lot, but it's something, uh, is that uh, there is a good news and a bad news. And uh, good news is human freedom and bad news is also human freedom. So that we have uh, this uh, opportunity to uh, think and act in uh, creative and productive and constructive ways and that can be beneficial for us as human beings, but also the rest of the species on this planet, or many of them. Uh, or we can use that freedom uh, the way we often use it, and that's to be destructive uh, toward the environment uh, or uh, ourselves, uh, our society, and so on and so forth. So it's really, uh, I think, critical that people kind of wake up on this uh, individual and collective level and uh, 
shut down a little bit uh, all those uh, nice gadgets and devices that they interact with all the time, especially in the time of lockdown, uh, uh, corona pandemic, uh, and, and try uh, to interact more with each other, uh, exchange ideas, uh, read more, and uh, mobilize uh, their uh, forces, personal forces and capacities and collective forces uh, to change uh, many of those uh, extremely destructive uh, uh, processes uh, that are currently going on and not just now but uh, already for some time. So I think, uh, yeah, human freedom can be both positive and negative uh, uh, news, good and bad. Uh, whether it will, what will prevail depends on us. Thank you. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you both of you so much for this uh, contribution to the, our Wisdom in Times of Crisis event. And um, have a beautiful rest of the day. You too. Thanks for the invitation. Yes, thank, thank you, you very much.